We all come from the mother, and to her we shall return like a drop of rain, rolling down to the ocean, hoof and horn, hoof and horn. All that die shall be reborn, corn and grain, corn and grain. All that fall shall rise again. We all come from the mother, and to her we shall return like a drop of rain rolling down to the ocean. Thank you so much for that, Amanda. Happy Ostara. It's such a pleasure to be here with you for, for this wonderful celebration. Thank you so much. For our more secular listeners, it's also the first day of spring, the spring equinox. Huzzah! Huzzah! It's happening, especially for those of us uh, uh, who live in the north. Obviously, Amanda, you live quite farther south than we do, but it really is like I'm just now starting to see the little edges of grass peeking out from under the four feet of snow that is only now receding. Yes. Yeah, yesterday our our lake that we live in front of it's all it's just been frozen heavy heavy for so long and then yesterday it was just rippling glass like the whole top layer turned to water but you could still see the white ice underneath and today it's gone again it's ice again but there was this moment that was like we might make it oh, spring is coming yeah here I mean it's I mean I'm in LA so there's the seasons are very different down here, but um, there's been a lot of hummingbirds come into my porch. And then a, a, a year ago, I planted a bunch of um, native plants in my yard. And, you know, often because the because we live in desert chaparral, um, they often take a long time to grow because they're kind of hardy plants that are really building some strong internal structures and things. So it takes them a while to get established, but they're really loving this rain and just kind of leaping out. And, and there's all these purple flowers and all the sages and everything. It's really gorgeous. It's so funny. I think in this, in this season that we're about to begin of Missing Witches, we talk a lot about water and about the desert. Um, so it's funny. We've already kind of opened with both of those ideas just by being with you and hearing you sing a book from your mother's book of shadows a song from your mother's book of shadows is that what you told us well it's a reclaiming did you grow up knowing that song or yeah a reclaiming yeah song? so they my probably a lot of your listeners if they're familiar with reclaiming will know this there was this one particular like cd i guess it would have been a tape then of um of chance and so we would always listen to this tape and on long drives we would sing them and so they're they're most of the songs on there are pretty famous and most people who practice in this tradition know all of these all of these songs wow but if you don't if you didn't have an exposure to that tradition I feel like there's very little chance you would have had that tape in your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't like the top 40s or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, but you can find them. Like if you, if you Google reclaiming chants, um, there's this really wonderful PDF and it'll take you to a website. And it also, there's like a bunch of links to examples of the songs being sung and, sung, and there's literally a song for every occasion. So if you're looking for some chance to sing with your people, uh, that would be the place to go. That would be where I would start. Am I not looking for chance? We're always looking for chance. <laughs> I would spend my whole life chanting. Well, because, you know, just the yeah. idea of chanting I mean, it's the basis for the idea of enchantment, right? Like chant, to enchant something is to mm-hmm. chant over it or to chant into it, to chant it into life. And so we should all be doing chanting a lot more, I think. You, you mentioned in your book, Initiated, mm-hmm. that your mother would chant over your pot of mac and cheese. And <laughs> yeah. I, I really related to that, that sort of very grounded, you know, you can chant over anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, you make it sacred, right? Exactly. That's how we make it sacred by by doing these small 
Mm, lovely little rituals to bring a little spirit, a little magic into our lives, even if it's just for the macaroni and cheese, which I happen to love. So I think it's very magical. <laughs> it's so delicious. Do you have any particular <laughs> Ostara rituals that you do every year? Or do you change them every year? What are your rituals around this time of year? Well, um, I usually re lead rituals um, for for my community on Astara, and we talk about how you know it's the vernal equinox when when day and night are equal, and um, I think a lot about what the the astrologer Dane Rudyard says of the equinox. He says that the power of the individual, which is the day force, and the power of the collective, which is the night force, are equal on this day. So there's a real sense of justice. I feel like the, the equinoxes are often about justice and about rebalancing and balancing things out. And, and so the holiday Astara is, well, legend has it, is the, the name Astara is the name of a Germanic goddess of springtime and the dawn. And then, of course, um, for Christians, Easter is the time of, you know, resurrection. So it's a time of rebirth. And so because it's the ver vernal equinox and it's also the first day of Aries, a sign of the ram, um, it's this time of uh, initiations and launches and, and new beginnings. It's the, the astrological new year. Um, so we do stuff around that and talk about that. Um, my mother and her coven would usually do ceremonies relating to eggs. So they might um, paint eggs, for instance. Oh, and, imagine yeah, painting they, eggs at this time yeah, of year. Yeah, <laughs> and they would, they would um, I'm looking at her book of shadows right now, and it says... She said she's talking about one t time when they made sugar eggs from sugar egg whites and whipped cream of tartar, and they used molds and they play and they played in the sugar as if it were white sand, and then they baked the halves of the sugar molds and then decorated them with scenes like snakes and flowers and chickens and swans and rabbits, which are all symbols of um astara and then they decorated the outside with icing and feathers and silver candy balls and even grape stems coated with frosting and she also gives a recipe that you can use let's see i think she says that you can use onion skins and she uses a lot of natural dyes for that um and then so while you're you can you can make these sugar eggs or you can use the natural dyes and I think it's vinegar to stain like the the shells of actual eggs if you if you use them and um, because it's you know traditional of course to to paint eggs and hang them from your trees because um, the egg is a symbol of you know rebirth and fertility which is it which is what the spring is all about so yeah, egg ceremonies. So one of the things that you can do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to, you know, egg and and hold it and um, imagine what you what your intention is or what you want to call forth into this new astrological year inside this this egg and visualize it in there growing and getting ready to to burst out. And you do this long enough until the energy inside just rises and becomes a tone and then bursts into a song of some kind or a sound of some kind. And that's something that's really fun, of course, to do in a group so that you can really raise the energy and feel, um, feel that expansion of your intention coming out of your eggs. And of course, the egg can be anything, really, if you... Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. The egg could be like, do you mean like a stone or something? Yeah. I mean, if you're not into eggs. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, like I said, you can make the sugar eggs uh -huh. as well. Right. So, um, or yeah, you could use a seed or something like that for sure. Yeah. I'm big on whatever, whatever you have around <laughs> to, oh, yeah. some degree, to some degree. <laughs> We're not going to be orthodox about it. You yeah. must have an egg. Yeah, no, it's fine. Use what you want. I was just going to say, especially right now, Amy and I keep talking about how um, we're all just so, sorry about them. I can hear the microwave beeping. 
Amy and I just keep talking about how we're all so depleted that um, lowering the complexity for any of our rituals just to care for ourselves and put put the simplicity first right now so that things come from like an act of just being as gentle as possible and as as low demand as possible on our on our depleted resources after the end of this year that we've been through. Mm, I hear you. Yeah, last night, you know, because the as we're recording this, you know, the new moon is coming and you know, before the new moon or leading up to the moon, new new moon, even on the new moon, I like to do cleansing rituals. So I was tidying up and I, I wanted to take a cleansing bath or clearing bath, you know, where normally you put herbs and you light candles and you evoke the deities and you put stones in the bath. And I was just like, if I have to do all of that, I am not going to take this bath. <laughs> I will not wait for a week if I have to do all of that. So I was just like, all I'm going to do is I'm going to like dump like a premix of this these bath salts into the water and I'm going to sit in it and I'm going to read a book and that's going to have to be enough and I think it's so important to let yourself streamline like that and not feel like every time you do a ritual it has to be this big production because then you just end up not doing them or worse you start feeling like they are kind of a drag and um, it's so important to take pleasure in whatever you're doing and, and to let it be nourishing rather than to be just one more thing that you have to plan for and stress about. Right. Yeah, like pleasure and play instead of another thing to be perfectionist about, for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have one question, and maybe this is too big of a question for a podcast, but what, if at all, <laughs> is the difference between doing witchcraft and being a witch? Well, I don't really see any difference between those two things. Like, I think if you practice witchcraft, then you are a witch, unless you practice the techniques or the, the rituals or the, use the tools of witchcraft and don't want to consider yourself a witch. <laughs> then, I mean, that's down to you. But yeah, I, I don't think. Um, I don't see that there is some kind of a line where I'm, I think what makes you a witch is that you say that you are one. I think it also helps if you practice, right? If you do the thing, like we can say that we're a poet, but if we don't write poetry, then, you know, the, the, our connection to poetry is going to be diminished by, by that. So really, it, witchcraft is an action, it, rather than just a state of being, I think. I have a follow-up question, and it's related to our books. Um, Amanda's read our book. Amanda wrote a beautiful, beautiful foreword for our book, Missing Witches. And there were so many times writing it that I wanted to talk to you about it, Amanda, because I had just read your beautiful book and you know we follow your work a lot and are inspired by it and we're you know writing the book is like going back over episodes of the podcast but also writing new material all the time and then struggling with you know your big spiritual philosophy like why are you writing what are you thinking about and mm -hmm. one of the big questions for us is like you know we included or, or the decisions and we talk about it in the introduction but we included people under the umbrella of missing witches or the great big tent of missing witches that didn't call themselves witches. Oh, I because, see. Because, you know, because there's something we wanted to learn from them or that we consider part of the pantheon of people we can learn from. And I wondered if you had thoughts about that when you read that bit. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say that I love your book so much. And I was very, very honored to write the foreword for it. Um, especially because once I started to read it, I was like, ah, oh, this is so good. I cannot wait to share this with the world. I hope that all of your listeners rush right out and buy it because it's just so satisfying to read. It's so beautifully written and um, the stories in it are so riveting and so necessary. Um, so I was, I felt like completely ecstatic to be able to be a part of it in some small way. Um, but as far as that question about, um, you know, claiming historical figures for witchcraft who maybe wouldn't have called themselves witches. I mean, to, I don't know. I don't know if there's a right answer for that. Or I, I certainly don't know if I'm 
like uh, qualified to, to <laughs> say, but um, I mean, I think um, I, I, it relates back to what I was asking too of this, like doing witchcraft or not calling yourself a witch, calling yourself a witch and not, because I've spoken to so many people who are like, oh no, I'm not a witch. But I do tarot and astrology, and I, you know, <laughs> practice spells. Well, yeah, and, yeah like I call in the goddess and everything. But. Yeah, so I think for a lot of the people that we talk about in the book, maybe they would have if it hadn't been too dangerous or too something for them to do so. Yeah, well, I think the understanding of what a witch is certainly seems to change, and what we understand as being a witch is different than you know people from like 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even 50 years ago really so I mean it's constantly being reinvented I, I you know as you were saying that I was thinking about you know the idea of for instance feminism like we know we all know a lot of folks like that right like you know feminine identifying people who might you know, believe that women should vote if they want to, or like be paid as much as men, <laughs> or, you know, not uh, like, or have like live in a consent based society, but, but they'd be like, but I'm not a feminist. And, um, and, and I always feel like I, it, often in those cases, I think, well, we must have different definitions of what feminism is then, because if you're practicing it, then it seems like, you are one, but I, I, I don't think that you can just say, I don't know. I think where it becomes really particularly tricky is when we're claiming for witchcraft um, practitioners who maybe aren't from our same cultural or racial or ethnic background. Um, because on one hand, I think you know, like, I, I think a lot of witches of color rightly want to have, uh, you know, people from their background um, as, as lineage holders, right? Like, you know, they, they want to, to see that. I don't want to say what they want to see, but I'm imagining mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is true. But then also, I think that um, it's just as easy to imagine witches of color are people who are not witches. Um, specifically, you know, folks of color saying, we don't want you to take mm -hmm. our person, like Maria Sabina, for instance, and, and call her a witch because she's not yours to take. And I don't, I, I, I don't know, because I, I don't think that the, any groups can really speak as a, as a monolith. Um, and I think that it's, a, it's definitely a complex terrain worth discussing. And I don't think we should avoid the conversation, but I don't know that I could like speak authoritatively on whether or not <laughs> it's um it's right to do that yeah i, I did speak speak to one uh shout out chelsea hey girl um i spoke to one uh, arisha devotee i invited her to be on the show and she was like i have to talk to my godmother first because i'm not sure how i personally feel about the word witch and she went and took it to her godmother and they had a conversation and decided yeah you know what it's fine go be on the show and then she was and it was wonderful but yeah i think it's a, a definitely a conversation worth having with the people that you admire and trust yeah that sounds like an exciting episode yeah, <laughs> yeah. chelsea hamlet i love her very 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 much hi chelsea so yeah, I mean, yeah. ultimately what, what we come down to is like, you know, witchcraft is choice making and that includes the witchcraft itself, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess if we go back to, I think it's Dion Fortune was the original one who said uh, that magic is the act of changing consciousness at will. I mean, many people do that. So many people are practitioners of magic and whether or not they would call themselves witches, um, I think it depends on their own situation. But um, for me, I can, speaking for myself, I just love to adorn myself with the word witch because it calls to mind so many exciting things for me and really embodies for me the idea of someone who is a champion of nature and is um, acts always already in resistance to um, 
you know, patriarchy and colonialism and racism and um, any anything that would uh, assault the the life force and f- freedom and dig- dignity and integrity of of the living beings on this planet and someone who uses the acts of ritual and enchantments and um, magical tools and the calling in of the elements and the four directions um, as, as their, as their tools to do this work. So for me, I love to call myself a witch, but that's just me. And I think um, the capitalist white supremacist patriarchy um, definitely does not want us to know that acts of healing and acts of resistance can be the same one in the same right yeah that that disrupts their cash flow (laughs) yeah tell me more about that tell me more about what you're thinking around like acts of healing and acts of resistance well specifically i spoke to um dr beverly uh smith and our listeners you'll hear that episode pretty soon but she said to me and I'm misquoting, but I will quote it specifically <laughs> in the episode itself. Um, but e- everything we do to help each other is an act of resistance. Mm, and to absolutely. Me, yeah. Mm-hmm. And to me, like, I think there's, there's very much a thing, like, if you're missing something in your life and you go and give it to someone else, then you, you get it, you know? Um, and so for me, healing, healing oneself, healing your community, healing the world, the resistance, the, I, I mean, it's all entangled for me. It's all kind of one thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm thinking about the idea in, you know, anti-racist practices or even the word anti-racist, this idea that in order to not be a racist you have to actively be anti-racist like you have to take strong acts against racism otherwise you're like pulled into the vortex of it or the black hole of it because um the forces of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy on our planet are so very strong and so kind of much the default mode specifically here in um you know the industrialized world so um I do feel like acts of healing are acts of resistance because, yes, when we stand up for each other and we stand in solidarity for each other, then we're abandoning the principles of, um, you know, individualism that are so foundational to our culture. On the other hand, I think... um, they need to exist. These acts of healing also need to exist in a pantheon with um, very muscular and um, martial forms of resistance. In other words, like strongly active um, in order for them to be effective, right? Because it's not just a monoculture. And I think that's one of the things that really... um, needs to be spoken about in the you know collective witch conversation that's happening because i think a lot of the time um we do get really focused on on healing or you know self-soothing or um uh or soothing others and there has to be a diversity of tactics i think (laughs) so in addition to healing there's also got to be like um active resistance and um campaigning and fundraising and um uh you know activism solidarity in in many forms Yes, you're making, reminding me of a piece I loved in in a Sylvia Federici book where she says something to the effect of like, capitalism isn't really afraid of our healing crystals. Like (laughs) capitalism's like, great, you can totally have that kind of witchcraft. Just sell it to each other, just relax right into that. That's perfect. Obviously not how Sylvia Federici writes. (laughs) That's me all the way, like misparaphrasing her. But but I think that's so accurate that like this sort of lull of just self-care and self-healing is something we have to periodically kind of challenge in ourselves and be be I love your phrasing of be be muscular. (laughs) Be muscular and martial. Yeah. Um well 
you know, as you're saying that quote from uh, Silvia Federici, which uh, whom I love, um, it, it made me think about a quote from uh, Peter Gray, who wrote a really wonderful book called Apocalyptic, Apocalyptic Witchcraft. And in it, there's an essay where he talks, he, he, he was giving a speech. Um, I don't know if it was at like PantheaCon or some, some kind of witch convention. And he talked and he was saying like, essentially like capitalist individualism or like capitalism with a capitalist C just does not give a fuck about your like fantasy role-playing life, uh, dressing up in cloaks and you like standing around a bonfire. <laughs> like people can think that that is really, um, you know, revolutionary or whatever, because we're not worshiping Jesus or we're not worshiping, you know, the shopping mall or whatever. But in fact, um, capitalism doesn't care as long as you show up to work and, you know, as long as you're uh, still consuming and still buying, like you can do literally whatever the fuck you want. Um, particularly, you know, if you're a white person, obviously people of color are like policed constantly and it's a, it's a different situation, but, um, you know, just in terms of the way that power, power works and is operating in the world. But one of the things that he really, um, provoke me to think about he's he's a controversial writer in a lot of ways but um but something really compelling to me about his work is this part in his essays where he's talking about um calling in the elements which as many of your listeners will know is something that is really fundamental to the practice of witchcraft you know we we start off usually by calling in the north the south the east and the west and often it's traditional in witchcraft to say something to the effect of like Hail guardian spirits of the north, spirits of stone and bone and blood, mighty watchtowers of the earth, come be here with us, attend to us, Um, hail and welcome. And he's kind of going through each of the elements that we're calling in, and he's talking about how um, our culture, our world, our planet is facing a very real and existential crisis brought about to us by, you know, industrial capitalism and colonialism. And that we are deluding ourselves if we're calling in, for instance, the waters. And meanwhile, like we're, we're speaking of the beautiful waters and the rains and, you know, the, the, the oceans and the rivers and calling in the whales and calling in the spirit of the ponds and the frozen lakes. And he's like beneath the waves, you know, are, is, is toxic plastic <laughs> is beneath the waves of California, like there are no, there, 99% of the uh, kelp forests are dead right now. And that means that there are no places for the otters to live. That means that there are no places for the fish to swim. That means that, you know, it, the ocean is becoming dead. And he's arguing that as witches, like we are resistors, like we are... Um, we like we are the custodians of of nature and that like if we're standing around in our cloaks with our pewter pentagrams and saying mm-hmm. things like hail spirits of of water hail and welcome and we're not acknowledging that those spirits of water are deeply under threat and that we need to show up like warriors to protect them um then you know it is just a fantasy dress up life and it is and it isn't to me real witchcraft because real witchcraft should be scary to the status quo it should be threatening and it is if we're living it correctly in my opinion it's not just something to make us feel good it is genuinely threatening and that is why um you know we align ourselves with for instance with the witches as sylvia frederici talks about of of the um resisting the enclosures in uh, medieval Europe, you know, who are, who are actively in resistance to uh, the assault of capitalism and uh, the, the expunging of the people from the land and the enclosures of the land. So I, I see witchcraft today is definitely carrying on in the tradition of that resistance, but it's very easy for us to be seduced into just thinking of it as something that is um, kind of a fun and soothing aesthetic. Aesthetic, yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I think that that's, it's okay. To, it's okay to be in love with the aesthetics of witch, witchcraft. I know that I certainly am. And I think a lot of people come to witchcraft through that. And that is great. Like it's a porthole to, it's a threshold for us to enter through. But then uh, I do think it's important that we go deeper because the goddess, the earth, the life force of the earth, the spirit of the earth is calling us beseeching us to please rise up and awaken and join her and fight for her honor, a fight on her behalf, fight for the living beings of this planet um, and the thriving of all beings on it. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's where I, I stand. <laughs> I, I try to do my best to uh, think of ritual, like not as the thing, but either the first step or the last step or sometimes both where, you know, whether we're in groups or whether we're, we're by ourselves, we're using these rituals to conjure the strength and the energy to take action. The exactly. action, the action is not the ritual itself. We're trying to conjure. Yes. I mean, it's all, it's, it's not separate, right? Like my friend Leah, who is, she lives in uh, Tucson and she, she has a program that works with a lot of uh indigenous artists from the area and she was telling me about how some of her friends who are I am so sad to say that I can't remember the name of the the people that that live in that area the Native Americans that live there but she was talking about how they're always like their grandmothers and stuff are always calling them home in the middle of you know, projects that they're doing together because they have to go pray over the fields. And um, she's, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. And she's like, yeah, they're like literally always praying over the fields and dancing over the fields and, and, you know, singing to the fields and things like that. And, um, and of course, by doing that, you're changing your relationship to the plants the crops to nature you know you're you're spending time with it you're relating to it you're honoring it and so because you are honoring it you have a different relationship with it and so because you have that different relationship with it you won't just destroy it because it's sacred to you and you've made it sacred through the practice of chanting over it and singing over it and blessing it and so for us as witches what we are doing also um you know, at witchcraft, we're we're also like we're we're reviving and inventing rituals for for those of us who, for instance, in my case, you know, don't necessarily have that relationship to the land to draw on. We didn't inherit that um, from you know our ancestors, colonizers, like who who d didn't have a connection to this land but if we don't have a connection to the land that we live on then we will destroy that land and we we are doing so so we like the the rituals where we are standing around fire blessing fire the rituals where we are calling in water and blessing water using water to bless ourselves we are establishing relationships and connections to those very fundamental life-giving forces on this planet um, because without those rituals then our relationship with those things is often severed so yeah I agree with you that um, that it's not the whole thing right like you know s saying prayers over water is not the same thing as um, you know standing in front of a dam that is like being built and, and trying to prevent people from building it. But they're all part of the same thing, right? They're not separate. Yeah. And to, to continue your example of, of the crops, I mean, there, there is the praying and there is the dancing, but there's also the weeding and the, yes. and the planting of the seeds. And, you know, it exactly. doesn't, it doesn't stop there. It, it exactly. There. Exactly. Yes. Like you can pray as much as you want, but if you don't put the seeds in the ground, it's not going to grow. Oh man, I think so much about, we interviewed um, Loretta, the death witch, and we were talking about um, exactly this like pro protest and action and ritual. And she said, there is no mundane. There is no mundane. It's not about doing the mundane work and the ritual work. Nothing is mundane. Every step of it is magical and powerful and you have to put your 
body on the line and and join the protest in the way that you can that that is available to you in the body that you're in and the space that you're in but i think about that all the time her her sort of the the energy coming off her that night in the moment being like there is no mundane well exactly there is no mundane and and also you know i i just think about our predicament in which we find ourselves we've already been talking about it right like all of us you know we're all witches we have the we have the dream witch lifestyle right we're podcasters and we're writing books and you guys are living out in the woods and you know i'm like here in my little bungalow in highland park and we're very privileged and everything and simultaneously we were just talking about how like we're too exhausted to put stones in our bath water because it's like there's too much going on and how it's so hard for us to do a ritual if it has to be elaborate because like we're exhausted and I think you know the nature of you know white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and colonialism is that we're constantly exhausted and overstimulated at the same time and that we can't um, find the resources to, you know, to do our ritual work or to, to, to be in a place of the sacred all the time. And, um, in that sense, getting back to, you know, what Amy was saying that, um, doing the rituals are an act of resistance, right? Because like, even just putting the, the bath salts in the bath water with intention is kind of like, walking the other direction away from constant um, either productivity or distraction or consumption. I had one listener write me a letter and she characterized her current feelings as um, feeling simultaneously bored and overwhelmed all the time. That is, (laughs) that is the state of like contemporary life, right? That's really um, well said. I just am. Loving your wind chimes right now. I'm so sorry. Do you want me to take them down? I, are you kidding? <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, here's a cake. Oh, do you want me to take the cake away? No, no, please do not take the cake away. My, I mean, my producer for my podcast, uh, Between the Worlds, Carolyn, she's always asking me to take my, my wind chimes down. Not because she doesn't like them, but because I think it makes editing really hard. But. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, but I, for me, it's like, it's such a, and again, it's a reminder of like simple things being healing, hearing, you know, across these airwaves, the wind moving through, I assume, some kind of wood or metal that's hanging yeah. from somewhere near your house. It's like this beautiful, magical moment that really is just like the breeze moving through some wood or metal. Yeah, well, they're metal and uh, it's a great reminder of what the wind can do. Make music. Yeah, especially at Ostara, we were talking before about like the wind, you know, and I think, you know, the temperature is changing, like meteorologically, you know, we understand that wind happens when you have a temperature change that happens quickly. And, um, but it's also these wind of winds of change that we can use metaphorically in Mm. our lives to cleanse us, right? Mm, Absolutely. I mean, that was one of the most exciting discoveries for me about witchcraft and something that really took my practice so much deeper was you know really truly honestly physically not just conceptually paying attention to experiencing the elements and how they work and what they're doing and and that it's not it's like it's not a concept that wind um you know, connects or moves or is air or breath or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a reality. Like we feel breath. And, you know, I love to go in in Joshua Tree, which is a very sacred place to me in the desert out here by Los Angeles. If you go out into these million-year-old rocks, they're like piles of rubble and they're red and brown and... um, very stark and powerful and ancient and um you go out into the midst of these huge boulders and often i will go there and watch the sunset and always right when the sun sets a huge wind kicks up and the reason for that i think is because of the sudden change in temperature causes either the warm air 
from that's been sort of sitting near the the earth to to slush up the sides of the rocks and then it pushes cold air down and so this whole big process just starts happening and you can feel it all around you and um you know whipping in your face and looking through your fingers and uh you know pulling on your clothes and you can just feel that active life force speaking moving dancing across the landscape and it's not a concept like it's a real thing and we can feel it and we can touch it and we can breathe it in and that's so exciting to me that to think of the sacred, to think of the deity, to think of the God and the goddesses as something we can touch, something that we can feel, something that gives us life, something that we inherently are and move through and witness and touch. It's just so exciting to me. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's all about for me. <laughs> right. That I do feel like, you know, watching the movement of the moon is not something like a story that somebody made up at any point. Like, exactly. Not, I, I, don't, I don't have to question it. I don't have to question the moon's, you know, intentions or if the moon has an agenda for, you know. Or its existence. Or, or its, like, or now it's, it's fundamental <laughs> existence. That's right. I'm moving my hands a lot, so I bump my microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to question it. You don't have to debate it. And also, like, we know it. the moon does affect us. It affects the planet. It affects the tides. It affects our blood. It affects our menstrual cycle. Like, it affects us, and that is not our imagination. It's not just wishful thinking. That is real. And and to me, that is very exciting that we can see it and feel it and and work with it in that way. Yeah, I mean, listeners, which is, if you haven't read Amanda's book, you must. This is a taste of the beauty and rage and eloquence and, and like, inspiration and fire for your work that, <laughs> that you'll get in that book. So hold it in your hands if you haven't yet. Um, the description of Joshua Tree in the beginning of the book stays with me, and I see it in my mind as you're talking about being in Joshua Tree. Um, my favorite version of the living the like powerful magic of nature in the space that I'm in right now that I was keep thinking about to tell you both about is that we, we finally have understood what happens with the lake. There's two times in the year when it goes very, very clear or when it goes very, very cloudy. And it's the water at the top of the lake becomes colder than the water below and cold water is more dense than hot water. So it drops down and it pulls up everything that's at the bottom and all the nutrients coming up feed the rest of the lake and feed the rest of the fish and all the oxygen being pulled down from the top provide like a central life to the plants at the bottom. And it happens twice a year when the cold and the warm water flip and we see it like it goes from being like super crazy crazy clear to like all of a sudden like just thick with silt and life and I don't know I feel like that so represents my own body like the monthly with the moon and then about twice a year in, in spring and the fall oh my gosh as you're speaking to this I just feel myself tearing up because it's just so beautiful this process like it's so magical to me the way that it all just works it all works together like the the cold and the heat and how it stirs up the nutrients and how it brings a life and it's just so I mean I, I just am on my knees in awe before the bounty and beauty of nature and it's something that our society has largely alienated us from. I know Risa and I talk all the time about like the longer we live in the forest, the more we understand, the more we understand how like it, it, it's connected to us, it, how it works. You know, I'm still very, you know, I've been living in the woods for a few years and I've, I'm not fluent in the language by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. It would take me thousands of years, but starting to living in it and starting to see it. Yes. Oh my goodness. It's so true. Like it's, it's alive and intelligent and full of magic and spirit. And it is truly such an incredible tragedy that we are distracted and pulled out of this experience, experience of incredible sacredness and luminosity to 
to be distracted by all the bullshit <laughs> culture. It like to you know jack in the box ads or something like that when there's this like magical beautiful thing that is just right there and that we're like there's just this whirlwind around us that makes it so that we can't we can't see it and uh you are you're very blessed to be to live, be living out there in the middle of this magical place i i remember reading i wish that i could remember her name now i have it written down somewhere um, uh, an indigenous speaker from South America, and she is a leader of a specific tribe of the Amazon, whose name I'm not remembering now. But uh, she she wrote this amazing and beautiful speech uh, about how it took her people thousands of years to understand to get to know the Amazon, right? To, to understand her ways and to learn from them. And she was talking about how, of course, the colonizers who are constantly talking about how intelligent they are and how wise they are and how sophisticated they are technologically will come into this thing that is so beautiful and so sophisticated and so intelligent and just destroy it without even knowing what they're doing. I mean, it's... And because so much of that knowledge was passed on orally exclusively, you know, these colonizers showed up and were like, they don't know anything. (laughs) Yeah, there's no book. Where's the book? (laughs) It was completely like illegitimized. All of the like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years these lessons took to learn. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it's... It's just an undescribably devastating, devastating loss. But I mean, I guess there's no way to but that to redeem that. There is no way to redeem that. Uh, but I think you know, um, when I feel like the, it's impossible, you know, so let's just give up. Like my answer to that is not nothing. What can I do? Not nothing. How yeah. can I help? Not nothing. Anything yeah. but nothing anything but nothing you know and sometimes it's going to be a great act and sometimes it's going to be very tiny but please not nothing i mean i think love also really helps <laughs> like you know just like loving like loving the forest loving your beautiful pond that is doing these amazing things um and showing up for it and getting to know it and becoming intimate with it i mean i think I think that's the way because like when we love something, we don't let it be destroyed. There, there is a tree that's right behind my house that there was a major windstorm and it knocked this huge branch and in a different direction, it would have come through my roof. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I you know, I, it could have hurt me or, or, you know, um, but it didn't. The branch went the other way. And I, I literally, I went outside and I wrapped my arms around this tree and I honestly wept and I was just weeping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for dropping that knot on my house. Like I, <laughs> I'm like, honestly, I'm like choking up thinking about it now. And, and I planted some, some plum trees um, last year praying that they bear fruit like five years from now and I I went you know after I planted them and I was like playing the dance of the sugar plum fairies on my phone and walking around (laughs) them you know it it really like you say like I love them I love them I don't I don't want anything to happen to them yeah and I'm and I'm grateful for the protection and the nurturing that they give me like this is such an amazing revelation you know it's like so emotional yeah yeah exactly it is so emotional i mean i was i've been reading this book um why fishes don't exist or sorry why fish don't exist i don't know if you've heard of it it's an amazing uh, book it's like a biography and an autobiography or memoir and also like kind of an analysis of like taxonomy and uh, science you know, a critical analysis, I would say. And in the book, the author talks about um, how the project of, you know, the Western Enlightenment was to essentially like order and classify everything, even 
uh, when those classifications don't exist, it like imposes this order on top of things that aren't actually true. So like the classification fish, she's, she argues basically doesn't actually exist. There are no fish. Mm. Everything is an individual. And be, but because we have these taxonomies where we're like, okay, well, you know, this is, um, you know, it, it goes like, I forget what the words are, like philology or something where like you can trace the you know, like the slug is an invertebrate and it goes in this class of invertebrates all the way back to, you know, the top of the food chain or whatever. And um, she was talking about how, for instance, like we can't see the intelligence of animals. Like there are fish with better memories than human beings, but we don't really call it memory. We call it instinct. Or there are birds that are able to build tools that are, um, in some instances, like more sophisticated for their purpose than human tools, but we don't call what they're doing intelligence. And because we aren't able to see that birds, for instance, are intelligent, because we've classified them as being instinctual, for instance, or we said, well, they have a small brain, so they are not intelligent. We are intelligent and they are not. That means that we can't we can't see that they are essentially human. We can't see that they are that they have an intelligence that that we don't have access to. And so they are having these full lives. Like, you know, we always thought that goldfish or fish in general didn't have, you know, that they were essentially like uh plants that moved, you know, they didn't have a mind. But now we're discovering that plants have minds plants help each other fish have very um uh, elaborate internal worlds and experiences and uh mushrooms mushrooms are like way smarter than me (laughs) (laughs) they're way smarter than all of us and we haven't been able to see it it's so embarrassing it's it's been right there i mean i like i think indigenous folks of all cultures and i include i imagine also like the indigenous people um of pre uh conquest like northern europe also probably had that relationship with with the land and with nature and recognized its its intelligence but um if if we're separate from it we don't we don't notice it as embarrassing as that might be (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm just like I'm grinning from ear to ear and also like weepy I feel I, I think about this all the time about animal communication animal intelligence animal brilliance and like it's just the next stage of what I'm I'm excited to advocate for and talk about and you know I I wanted to jump in earlier thinking about things we can advocate for that give us hope. And we have clues for those things in the work of which writers, you know, like we can pour our love into our natural environment and let that teach us about how to love and and how to listen. And we can advocate for common land. Like that is, that's a really concrete thing that was taken from us that we can fight for and have back and common ownership of our resources and then basic income is a natural outgrowth of common ownership of our resources like those ways of breaking ourselves from capital and from the constant fear of having to pay and having to pay and having to pay to survive are ways that we can break and wake up and then this this for me those those are two things that I'm interested in advocating for always and then the next one for me I'm always thinking about is is animal communication and plant communication and how do we treat them like the real allies and leaders in saving this this planet and saving our lives you know yeah here here i do remind want to remind (laughs) our our listeners really quickly that if the idea of land back scares you like nobody's coming for your grandpappy's farm 80 percent, i think of canada is crown land that means owned by the government so once again, if the idea of land back scares you, you need not be afraid. <laughs> you yeah. Need to yeah. I think it's really, mm, it's really sad, right? Because people have this idea of land back as like someone coming to take something from oh, you. I, and I like wonder why it. people would think land <laughs> yeah, like someone exactly. coming to take something from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a ret- divine retribution of some kind. But yeah, like, but that that's such a misunderstanding of what 
would actually happen, right? Because like, we're not giving up something that is good for us. <laughs> like, be giving up, like, essentially being, um, being in, I don't want to use this, like being um, roped in, being interpolated into a culture that actually causes us harm. Like, why do we want to participate in that? It will be so much better when the land is, is back in the hands of the people who nourish and sustain it, the stewards of that land. I mean, that's a whole long conversation. <laughs> but yes, I'm really glad that you you mentioned mentioned that and to, and helped people understand that it's not it's not going to be as painful as they think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know we could spend all day on all of these things. Let me get back to initiated one more time because I really like, you know, I, I told you in an email before that you know you're you're quite a far bit ahead of us in this book witch process so you know well, not really <laughs> well i mean your your book has been in the world for mm. um more than a minute yeah yeah about can, years. since can, 2019 yeah so can you talk about like um risa hates it when i say this but i always bring it up that uh, mama lola said of her biography i hate the book because it changes and i don't and I don't want to imply that I hate our book. I certainly don't hate your book, Amanda. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. But how do you personally, as advice for me personally, Amy, um, deal with um, taking something and putting it into the world and not being able to make notes? Oh, girl. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard, right? I mean, I I stand by initiated and I, I do think that, you know, I accomplished what I set out to do and there are a lot of things that I would do differently if I were to do it again and so I got a piece of advice when I was in grad school at CalArts I can't remember who gave me this advice but it really helped me and it really stays with me which is that you fix the problem of your project in the next project. So, you know, oh, what you, a relief, right? <laughs> it is a relief because, because if you keep tinkering with your project until there is no more problem, then you will never finish that project. Like you will never get the perfect book. Like as soon as you put it onto the page, it is imperfect and it's not what you want. It's never as good as what you imagine it might be. And of course, you know, we're always growing and changing. So a lot of the things that I, um, you know, the perspective that I had when I first started writing that book was different than the perspective I had by the time I finished it. And it's certainly different than I have, you know, now two years later. So, you know, it's just kind of a snapshot of what I was thinking about at the time. And if I were to go back through and consider, you know, things that I think, think were problems about it or things that I would like to change. Like I can't change that. It's done. It's done. It's out there. It's in the world, but I will work to change it in the next project, which is also really helpful because it makes you excited about getting started on the next project rather than confronting the terror of, of, you know, doing this whole big process again, because writing a book, as you know, is excruciatingly painful. So it's hard to make yourself want to do it again. <laughs> Can you tell us about your next project? I'm super excited to hear what's coming next. Yeah, well, so it is, um, I, I can't get too specific about it yet, but I will tell you that it is about, um, yeah, intimacy with the land. And it's uh, about finding ourselves in space and time and um, creating a sense of belonging through, through ritual and through magic. And um, I'm, excited I'm excited because, you know, initiated was very personal and it was very much about excavation of my, of my life and how I came to, to witchcraft. And there, you know, th there's a lot of witch wounds that I was working through. And I think a lot of people do come to witchcraft through their wounds. And so I thought it was important to talk about that because um, 
you know, as we were talking about, like in, you know, Instagram witchcraft or something, there's a lot of love for the aesthetic or for the like love and light aspects of, of witchcraft, which are great, but um, there's a lot more going on. I think there's a, there's a bigger reason why we're called to this work. Um, and I think that it is really about, you know, some of the grand meta narratives of history, um, you know, capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, that, are, that, that we can't just like sweep, sweep under the rug. And I was really looking at those things and how they were manifesting specifically in my own life through my own personal experience. And I really did exercise some demons with the help of Medusa and Hakate and some other folks, um, Persephone in, in that book. Um, but this time, because that, that, you know, I've kind of entered into a clearing or I, I kind of left the woods behind. Um, so now I really want to look outward more, you know, so it's, it's more about, about the world around me than it is about my internal world. So I'm excited to, to do that. But final thing I'll say about that is that I think it was, oh, um, what's the name? Oh my gosh. What is the writer's name? On earth, we were briefly gorgeous. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? No, but I'm writing it down. Yeah, he's a poet. Um, God, I'm sure there's people out there screaming his name right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite things to do when I'm listening to podcasts is scream out the things that the people... Yeah, <laughs> but, but so he was saying that um, the difficulty with writing a book, and I certainly found this to be the case, is that I didn't know how to write initiated when I first started writing initiated. By the time I finished initiated, I did know. And it was a hard won battle, right? Like I, I really had to work to, to know how to write that book. And I only knew at the end and it made me <laughs> want to go back to the beginning and write it all over again because I was like, oh, this is how it should be written. Um, but he says the difficulty is, of course, that your next book is not your old book. And so you have to learn how to write that book, right? Like it's, you do learn some skills from your previous book, but unfortunately the next book requires new tools and new skills and new ways. And I'm, I'm definitely finding that in this project that I'm working on now. Do you guys know what you're going to write about next? Well, we're, we're always writing more research pieces about witches that we're so excited about. So it sort of feels like the next book writes itself, you know, like we have the list, we have the stories, we want to dig into them and then tie them to the, to the people that we are now. So I don't know what Amy would say, but that's for me, I feel like the next book is like just ready, almost ready to, to start to hatch. But Yay. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've said this before on the podcast that I think I would have been too intimidated to write a book. And the fact that we wrote it a little bit at a time before we even knew it was going to be a book was very useful for me. So I didn't have that like, you're writing a book. Yeah, trick yourself kind of, into writing a book. Yeah, yeah, so basically. We totally that, tricked yeah, ourselves. That's exactly, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what we did. That's think, great. You know <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that sometime. Yeah. But I, I really I wanna thank you. <laughs> I wanna thank you, Amanda, for initiated because I think you know you you say you were you were writing about yourself and unpacking yourself, but as we go on this journey with you as as readers, it, it helps us on our, our own journey and to discover things about ourselves. You know, you become part of that nature that we look to to learn things about ourselves. And I really specifically want to um give someone appreciation for your honesty and um a genderlessness in that honesty and it really like listeners if you have not read initiated i suggest you do that today if you have read it then go on to goodreads and leave an amazing review about how amazing it is oh so that, thank you so, so, that, much, so that other people will find it it really is just again like i laughed i cried um and I definitely like through learning about you learn something about myself. And Isn't that interesting though? Yeah. Like another one of my writing teachers, I think it's like a common thing to talk about in writing about how your writing becomes more universal, the more specifically personal it is. Mm. Right. 
So like the more you write about your own very specific idiosyncratic experience, the more it becomes relatable than if you were just writing about like the generic witch experience, which actually relates to no one. Mm-hmm. But I really appreciate what you're saying about that. And yeah, you know, it's funny, like in terms of like, I, I think it's kind of a polarizing book. Like the, the people who love it really love it. And then one of the most common criticisms that I get about it is like, well, I really wanted it to be more like a manual of witchcraft. But I always think that's kind of like someone saying, well, I want, I really wanted Cheryl Strayed's book Wild to be more of like a manual of hiking the Pacific Coast Trail. And it was a <laughs> memoir about it. And I'm like, well, that's not what it was. I mean, it was a memoir. And, 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 so. and you never claimed otherwise. Like the title is Memoir of Witch. Like, like literally, <laughs> dude. <laughs> like it is not a manual of witchcraft. It's not initiated a manual of witchcraft. It's <laughs> initiated memoir of one specific witch. That's it. And people, and, and so like people who are ready to read a memoir and are like ready to, um, dive in more to maybe the why of like why and how we become witches rather than like, you know, anoint this candle with, you know, rosemary or whatever. Um, I feel like those are the people who really respond to and and get the book. Um, Another weird thing people will say about it sometimes is uh, that like they, there's, (laughs) <laughs> so it looks like uh, Risa's got some stuff to know with her little one, but um, yeah. So just like, kind of in closing, yeah, that like people um, weirdly will sometimes want your life to have been different than it was. So <laughs> they'll be like, "Oh, you know, these things happened to her, and that seemed like like they didn't really want me to talk about it." And I was like, "Well." I mean, sorry, but that's what happened. Like, yeah. that's the reality of what of what was happening. Like, so, like, I can't make it be different than what it was, really. Yeah. But, um, but then a lot of people, exactly, like you know, like you said, are excited about the honesty and and feel um, feel solidarity because of that. So, I appreciate that. I feel like you're my people. Then, <laughs> I, found it, found my, it's in the right hands. My mantra um, as we go toward our publication date, which is like in days now, um, is you can be the juici- juiciest, sweetest peach in the whole tree, and there are just going to be some people who just don't like peaches. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. Like, and I love peaches, and you know, so I'm going to eat a peach. I love peaches. I love your book. I, everybody needs to run out and read your book. It is so good. I just felt so loved reading this book, and I felt like so delighted to hear these stories of these women and witches that I admired for have admired for so long and wanted to know more about and your storytelling ability is so good and you do put rituals it is also a manual so you really like <laughs> like I remember when you asked me to um to to do the the forward and I think I said something to you like this is the book that I wish that I had written and like I really do mean that it is so good so you managed to combine all of these amazing things and that it took extraordinarily extraordinary talent and skill to be able to do that so I'm I'm taking a lesson from you guys and I will say, Amanda, you know this, but I just want to say it one more time that you um, generously and beautifully crafted that forward for our book, sent it to us. I received it on my birthday Yay. Um, last year, I guess. And it was legitimately, and I say this in 100% genuine honesty, one of the most validating experiences of my life reading Aww. the forward that you wrote. I just felt like if this person got that from what I did, then I, I did it and I did it right. Yes. Um, yeah, Thank exactly. You. That is the feeling, you know, I, like the, I've gotten some, some amazing feedback from folks, you know, like, yeah, some people don't get the books, but then when the people do get it, like, you're just like, Oh, if just even that one person just like really got it. I feel like my work is done. So yeah, you, it, your work um, really landed with me and uh, I'm so glad that you know that because <laughs> I want you to I want you to to feel it about how how much I appreciated this work um, because I'm so excited for for all the good it's going to do in the world for your listeners for my listeners for the world of witches and beyond 
it's just got so much work to do in the world. So I can't <laughs> wait for it to get out there and do it. <laughs> and the witch work is not completed, everybody. Let's keep working. But Amanda, before you sing us out, yeah. um, I will say of both Initiated and Missing Witches, Initiated by Amanda Yates Garcia, Missing Witches by Avery C. Dickens and Amy Tork. If you've already bought it, amazing. Thank you. If you haven't bought these books, go buy them now. Again, if you have bought them, review them. Um, go to your local library and ask them to stock them so that maybe some other young witch 20 years from now will find it on the shelf having never heard of us before that's one of the thrilling ideas that comes to me sometimes so yes please initiated missing witches buy them for your friends and family read them sleep with them under your bed <laughs> Huzzah! yay Thank you. i second all those emissions <laughs> can you sing us out for a star please i i would love to okay so this is the um the traditional song for the closing of this circle in my uh, tradition of reclaiming. And it goes a little something like this. Our circle is a hope and yet unbroken. May the peace of the goddess be ever in our hearts. Mary, meet and Mary, heart. And marry me again. And marry me again. Thank you so much, Amanda, for literally everything. <laughs> the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Happy Austera to you. And Risa, I know that your uh, your little baby may had a little issue, so we wish you <laughs> all love for the rest Thank of your you. night too. Oh, she's here. <laughs> I'm here. I she she was briefly throwing herself against the door and then also like rocking out with her dad to some John Prine. So I was just oh, nice. and now she's back, so I'm gonna go. But I just love you both so much. <laughs> and we love, Yay, you, love all. you too. Like, Mommy, come here. <laughs> we love you all. Happy Austera. Happy Star, everybody. You must be a witch. If you want to support the Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code Missing Witches when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at Tee Public.